I'm not supposed to bring this one up. It's not very, like, lit up here. It's not. That's why I have my glasses. <laughs> Do we need a light? It's not very bright up here. Should the lights be on? Or, like, one? You don't want it to be, like, an oven. This is true. <laughs> a heat lamp. Cooking. Canning. Canning lamp. What's that? Are they going to put a light up here? Or? Huh. Good morning. If everyone could please take their seats. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shelley Redman, the CEO of the Huntington Society of Canada, or HSC. I am so pleased to welcome you to our 2023 National Conference, the first in-person conference since 2018. It's pretty amazing to be here. I'm also joined by Angèle Bernard, our National Director of Family Services. Merci. Merci, Shelley. Annie. Bonjour, hello everyone. Je m'appelle Angèle Bénard, directrice nationale des services aux familles pour la Société Huntington du Canada. Je suis tellement heureuse de vous accueillir ici à Niagara Falls pour la première conférence depuis Kelowna en 2018. C'est incroyable de finalement pouvoir être ensemble. J'aimerais prendre un moment pour souligner certaines vérités. As we gather here today, I would like to take a moment to remember those who have come before us those that could not be with us today, and those that will be part of our HD community in the future. As a de descendant of the Algonquin, Anishinaabe, and French people, I recognize that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the First Nations, such as the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people. It is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Agreement. This agreement was created to ensure that everyone and everything can access the necessary resources for quality of life. This is fitting as we gather here, as our mission at the Huntington Society is to also ensure that families have access to the resources that can enhance their quality of life. It is also worth mentioning that this land is directly adjacent to the Haldeman Treaty Territory on which sits the HSC National Office in Waterloo. So today, it continues to be the home of many Indigenous peoples, Inuit and Métis, and we are reminded that the great standard of living enjoyed in Niagara Falls is directly related to the resources and friendships of the Indigenous people who make up this community. Merci. Miigwech. Thank you. And now I'm excited and honoured to introduce a distinguished guest, Haley Bateman. Since 2022, Haley has been serving the people of St. Catharines as regional councillor. Haley's determination to ensure that local politicians remain transparent and accountable to their community has garnered a great deal of attention in recent years. Haley has been an active volunteer for the city of St. Catharines and by extension, the region of Niagara. Haley chaired the Equity and Inclusion Advisory Committee, pushing for a more inclusive and diverse governance model. She aided in the creation of the Equitable Recovery Subcommittee in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The end result of the subcommittee's work was a fulsome, equitable plan currently being adopted by the City of St. Catharines. She also sat as a member of the Social Sustainability Pillar Committee. A lifelong resident of Niagara, Haley lives in St. Catharines with her partner and their children. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. On behalf of regional chair and the Niagara, excuse me, on behalf of the regional chair and Niagara Regional Council, it is my distinct pleasure to extend a heartfelt welcome to each of you attending the 50th annual Huntington Society Conference in beautiful Niagara Falls, which happens to be my hometown. In particular, I would also like to welcome Ariel Walker, one of the founding members of the Huntington Society of Canada and one who has strong ties to Niagara.
This milestone event marks not only the annual gathering of dedicated individuals committed to advocating and understanding the treatment of Huntington's disease, but also celebrates the remarkable 50-year journey of the Huntington Society of Canada. Your unwavering dedication to this cause has undoubtedly made a profound impact on the lives of those affected by this disease. We are honored to host such a significant milestone in your organization's history. Niagara Falls, with its natural beauty and vibrant community spirit, provides a fitting setting for this important conference. As you come together to share insights, exchange knowledge, and forge new connections, may this event serve as a catalyst for continued progress in the fight of Huntington's disease. Our region is thrilled to play host to this gathering of compassionate individuals working towards a common goal. I encourage you to take some time to explore the wonder of Niagara Falls and immerse yourselves in the warmth of our community. Thank you for choosing Niagara as the backdrop of this momentous occasion. I wish you a productive and inspiring conference filled with meaningful discussions, valuable connections that will contribute to the ongoing success, success of the Huntington Society of Canada. Thank you. I do have a... Uh, Chair Jim Bradley um, speaks so highly of this group. Uh, he wasn't feeling very well today, so he asked me to step in. Um, we do have a scroll prepared. Um, you know, as, a, as somebody who was born and raised in Niagara Falls, it is such a pleasure to stand before you and welcome you to my hometown. Um, thank you for all the work you do. I know that um, you're making lots of strides um, with Huntington's disease, but I know the work you're doing also helps a lot of people who are living with rare diseases. So on behalf of Chair Jim Bradley, Thank you for the work you do, and congratulations on your 50th anniversary. Thank you, Thank you, Haley. And now a word from our hosts, the Niagara Chapter of the Huntington Society of Canada, as well as HSC's past board chair, Brindel Mayo. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I would first like to thank the Niagara chapter for the incredible work that they've done over a very prolonged period to bring us together today. I would also like to thank the incredible dedication of our tremendous staff team. Again, they have been working tirelessly to bring at last count, over 281 people together in this room with even more joining us online. So thank you to everyone for the work you've done. As was mentioned, this weekend is always a tremendous, inspiring, connecting opportunity. And I hope that you all have a chance to come out with more hope, more joy, more connection than you feel already here today. Um, I would like also just to thank this chapter, the board, the staff, the team for all of their support to our board over the year. And a special thank you to Mac Erno for allowing me to make these remarks this morning because Niagara is my home. This is where my journey with HD began and it, it truly is an honor and a privilege to be in front of you today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Bryn. And Daly as well. Very nice words. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and esteemed delegates from across Canada. On behalf of the Niagara chapter and our local volunteers, it's my honor and privilege to welcome you to the 2023 National Conference in the city of Niagara Falls. I'm thrilled to see so many friendly and familiar faces amidst the jaw-dropping beauty of the falls. While you're in town, 
as Haley mentioned, please make sure you try to get out and see the great job that Niagara Parks has done in the landscaping around here. And also, starting uh, tomorrow, Niagara Parks will kick off their world-famous Winter Festival of Lights. Stop by the welcome table just out here if you need any more details. Oh, I did lack a Kleenex, but I left it in my, in my bag. I did bring one. I was prepared. Because I did. Thank you. This was only going to be three minutes, but I think it might be five. <laughs> Fifty years ago, Ralph and Ariel Walker formed the Huntington Society of Canada from scratch. They built, they built the entire organization on a foundation of family, an HD community where people felt safe. That HD community feeling still exists today. From the beginning, the Niagara chapter was one of the original partners. Dorothea Smith and Stan Edwards were the people who made our chapter who we are today. As we gather over the next couple of days, we are united by a common purpose, to make a positive impact in the lives of those affected by Huntington disease. This conference serves as a platform for us to come together share knowledge, and collaborate towards finding ways to improve lives of those living with HD. The Huntington Society of Canada, with its unwavering commitment to supporting individuals and families affected by Huntington disease, has been at the forefront of this for 50 years. Thank you to the HSC office and staff for the incredible work you have done to make this event happen. Attending, you may have noticed on some people's uh, name tags, attending this year's conference, there are many first-timers. I'd like to welcome just a few. Firstly, uh, Shelley, our CEO, thank you for your leadership for the conference and making this become a reality. Thank you and your staff. There's a lot of new-timers from the staff. Second, from, the, uh, from our Niagara Resource Center director, Muna Young is here for her first conference, and Muna does an amazing job in the egg. A brand new chapter from Sarnia. Congratulations, it's their first conference because they didn't exist before. Congratulations, Sarnia and Celine, for that. Janice Hickey and Ron Culp are our first time delegates as part of the Niagara chapter, and it's their first time representing us, and it's their first time at a conference at all. So Janice and Ron do a great job. And finally, my sister Jill and her husband Jerry from the Durham chapter is here today as a first-time conference. And our brother Mark and his wife Kim will join us tomorrow. Kim is still working. The rest of us are retired. This conference is not just about education and information. It's about coming together as a community, forging new friendships, and finding solace in the shared experiences of others. It's about creating a network of support that extends far beyond these conference walls. Once again, I extend my warmest welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you for being here, for your dedication to this cause, and for your unwavering support. Together, we can make a difference. Enjoy the conference. So thank you, John and Bryn, and thank you so very much to the entire chapter for hosting us this year in your beautiful hometown. It's almost the end of our 50th anniversary year, so it is particularly fitting that we can gather one last time to mark 50 years of community and look forward to decades to come. Conference is our community's special time to shine. It's a chance to get the scoop on the latest Huntington disease developments from experts worldwide. 
You can even kick back and chat with these pros asking all the burning questions that you have about Huntington disease research and care. Plus, we've got presentations from our HD community all-stars like HD Buzz. And of course, there's ample opportunity to hang out, mingle, and enjoy some celebratory dinners. Conferences about sharing knowledge from top-notch clinical and caregiving tips to the latest in research support. It's also about reconnecting and realizing that you're part of a larger caring community. It's an inspiration infusion. We want you to make this conference your own. So feel free to take breaks whenever you need them. Don't worry if you miss something. We'll have all the sessions recorded for you to catch up on them. These two days are packed with exciting content and there's enough to keep you busy for days, even after the conference wraps up. A word about photographs and filming. At this event, photos and videos may be recorded. By attending this event, you may be included in these videos and photos. Please be aware that by entering the event areas, you can send to such recorded content and its release, production, and exhibition for reproduction for promotional purposes. If you do not wish to be photographed, please let us know at the registration desk. And now, here's some tips for an, to have an amazing conference experience. So you'll find so much information in your program, uh, including a map of where the washrooms are, along with the rooms for the breakout sessions. The registration desk is the place to go with any questions. It's on the third level, and it is open until 3.30 today and 8 to 3.30 tomorrow. Conference is a great time to raise awareness, to share your photos on social media using hashtag HSC Niagara. Ask first to make sure everyone in the photo is comfortable and fine with that. Make sure you're following us on social media. We'll be posting fun updates and conference highlights on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget to use the Feedloop app for fun games and more information. You can uh, use the app to learn about sessions, speakers, and collect points throughout the conference. Look for QR codes and listen for keywords hidden throughout the conference to earn points and win prizes. For example, the keyword for this session is welcome. Pop it into your app to earn points. You can redeem points for all types of HSC swag. Some items may have limited quantity, so make sure that you snatch them up before, they're gone, for the, before they are all gone. Another pro tip, the resource fair is a great place to earn points. It's open daily bre from breakfast until the final keynote takes the stage. Drop by the tables to learn about a variety of services and resources available. You can also buy an Amaryllis, some 50th mer merchandise, or make a donation there. These contributions make it possible for us to hold conference. We'd like to be able to keep doing so, so please consider giving at the booth. Bring your vendor postcard to be stamped by reps at all of the booths. When it's complete, go to the registration desk. They'll give you a slip to fill out for your chance to win a prize. Chill Zone is an open place for a respite. If you need a break from programming, visit the Upper Falls View, Upper Falls View A Room if you wish to speak with a member of the Family Services team, please ask a volunteer and they will make contact. Thank you for being here, for your unyielding commitment, and for making this conference a, vi a vibrant and thriving gathering to hope and progress. That goes for sponsors, speakers, volunteers, staff, and attendees. Everyone plays a part in this experience, and I am so grateful. Let's make the most of our time together and may the days ahead be filled with inspiration, learning, and a profound sense of togetherness. And now, it is my honor to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Sir Charles Sabine. Emmy award-winning TV journalist, Charles Sabine, OBE, worked for the US uh, network NBC News for 26 years. During this time, he witnessed 24 wars, six revolutions, and four earthquakes, and most of the news events of Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia since the early 1980s. There, he learned firsthand the extraordinary limits that the human spirit is capable of reaching in the face of tragedy inflicted by both nature and society. In 2008, he decided to put the lessons of those experiences to a different use. He became a pioneering spokesperson for freedom of scientific research and those affected by degenerative brain illnesses, in particular, Huntington disease, which has touched his family. That role 
led to Sir Charles speaking at prestigious venues across the world, including the European and British parliaments, the Royal Institution in London, the World Congress on Freedom of Scientific Research, as well as the Vatican. In her last New, New Year Honours list, Queen Elizabeth II awarded the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, or OBE, to Sir Charles, global campaigner, Huntington disease. This was the first... This was the first time in the history of these awards that the words Huntington disease were used in a citation for an OBE. The title of the keynote is How Far We Have Come and Where We Are Heading. Sir Charles will describe the lessons he learned from his time at NBC, his family's Shockington Huntington disease, Shockington, shocking Huntington disease story, and his discovery of the hugely underestimated prevalence of the disease due to centuries of shame and stigma. He will also relate the story to, of the unprecedented global collaboration between researchers and HD families that has made research into this field the most thrilling anywhere in medicine. And now, to officially launch our conference, Sir Charles Sabine. I think we've got a new word, Shockington. I like that. I think that is very, it's very descriptive and perfectly apt. I think we can, I'm gonna work out ways that we can have a Shockington conference. <sighs> Shirley, thank you so much. And happy birthday, Huntington's Disease Society of Canada. Um, lovely to see you there, Ariel. Uh, uh, it's um, what a fantastic um, setting. Uh, I've been to dozens of conferences around uh, in four continents, but I can tell you that this is the most spectacular setting, hands down. Uh, what a place to, have, to hold the conference. And what a relief to be here uh, together in person, isn't it? Now, I mean, I'll ask that again. What a relief to be here in person, isn't it? Yeah. Right, okay. And it's also wonderful for me to be personally back on Can Canadian soil. It, the last time I was here was 2014, the uh, HSC conference in Winnipeg, nine years ago. Um, a lot has happened uh, in those nine years, both in, across the world and in the, uh, for us, HD families. My, we had a trying time with COVID, didn't we? we um, it was hard uh, and we had, it seemed, some real setbacks during it. Um, but were they? Just how bad were they? I, I, I think it might be that now we can look back at those events in a different light, and that's what I'm gonna to do today. And although this keynote is titled, as you see, uh, how far we've come and where we are going, and that is correct, that, that is what I'm gonna be say, talking about, I think it could also just as well have been called speed bumps, not brick walls. And you'll see what I mean by that. So, Yes, my, my last time in Canada was uh, 2014, but I was also with several Canadian families from Huntington's disease families um, in 2017 in another country. So to explain where that was and why we all met there, I'm going to start us off with a short film made that year about a trip I made to South America. And as you watch, it will become apparent who we made it for and thus where we were.
Your Holiness, the last person you saw in that film is a 15-year-old girl from Buenos Aires called Brenda, and accompanied by uh, Axel, the singer from Buenos Aires as well, she is going to present you a scroll describing the goals of this event for the Huntington's community. And we brought those people from some of the remotest parts of South America where they had never left their villages to meet their Pope now, as well as an event which was by any measure deemed impossible, this was a truly significant moment in the history of Huntington's disease. Why? Well, no world leader had ever publicly met an HD patient. That little girl, Brenda, who you saw me introduce to the Pope Francis on the stage, she had uh, been told by her, her fellow pupils at her school had been told not to touch her because they might catch Huntington's disease. So you can just imagine what uh, it meant to have the, their Pope hug her on the stage. Um, no world leader had even spoken the words Huntington's disease on a, on a world stage. And the events of that day and uh, the journey of those families to Rome was made into a film, Dancing at the Vatican, which some of you may have seen. Um, if you haven't, you can still see it, well, not still, but you can certainly see it on YouTube um, in six languages, including French, I'm glad to say, for those here from Quebec. Um, so, watch it if you haven't seen it. And this is Buckingham Palace, uh, late 2021, the first time, as Shelley said, that Huntington's disease the words had been used in a citation for an OBE. And, but of course, that was a, a proud moment for, moment for me. But, but far more important was what it meant for an ailment that has for so long been surrounded by shame and st st stigma. And um, both these events say a lot about where we've come in the history of Huntington's disease. And please, no one call me Sir Charles. I'm just Charles, please. <laughs> really, I'm still Charles with Huntington's disease. So, um, is, so it hasn't all been easy since I was last here. As I will now relate, it has been a bit of a roller coaster. Uh, but crucially, again, no brick walls. So, for the sake of younger people who I'm not, we're not probably there in Winnipeg uh, nine years ago. Let's uh, go back to see where, where we've come from. And to do that, I'm going to tell you, first of all, a bit of my story. Most of my time at NBC News was spent in places like that, Gaza, very much in the news again. And during my many tours there, I was the last person the last Western journal journalist to interview Sheikh Yassin, the uh, founder of Hamas. But it wasn't just Gaza, there were 25 countries and territories with conflicts where I saw the human spirit tested at, at its most tested, drawing lessons from those experiences. Much of my life was spent in Baghdad, a place that reminds you that good health can never be taken for granted. Sorry if there are any young people here who heard a bad word. Um, yeah, so I did draw lessons, uh, and well, Baghdad was a place that reminds you then that you can't ever, that life can throw at you all sorts of things you could do without when you're not expecting them. And seeing all of that death affects your priorities and your perspective. You learn how n none of us is immune from disease. My personal reminder of that came about in 1994 with news of my father. He was suffering from something I had never heard of, Huntington's disease. I learned that it was incurable and untreatable and genetic, and I learned about the test. Uh, my uh, brother tested 
straight away, uh, positive. But I decided to wait. There didn't seem much point to me to get testing at that point. My dad was a career soldier, and my mother nursed him personally till his death over 10 years. But she never said the word Huntington's, not once. Is that familiar in this room? There were no standards of care to follow, just stories of people like my father being placed in padded cells and fed through hatches. The lack of dignity was, was bad enough, but worse still was the knowledge that he could pass that knowledge on to his sons. And this looks like a fairly ordinary, typical family photograph, my brother and I, mother and father. But there is a whole different dreadful dimension, unique to HD, encapsulated in that photograph, because there was someone missing from that picture, and my parents knew it. A half-brother, Nigel, who I never knew existed almost all his life because he had wrongly been assumed to be the son of my uncle Tony. And Tony had, unknown to me, Huntington's. My family went to extraordinary lengths to hide Tony's existence, burning wedding photographs and having his death certificate changed. I took that picture the day I met my brother, Nigel, months before he died. He had spent a decade in care with no visitors, unaware that he had any family to give a damn whether he lived or died. As you know, in this room, in our world, that story is far from extreme. I'm going to bet that, like me, all of you HD families here have experienced some form of deception or mistruth in the past about HD in, in your family. And you know people who are still hiding it, we all do, and they're making the situation much worse. They're compounding the relentless cycle of misery of this disease. So the brother I did know, John, was five years older than me. He studied law at Oxford University in England and went on to be a senior lawyer, uh, what the British call a, a barrister. In the words of the current High Court Judge Freeland, QC, he was the most brilliant lawyer of his generation. John died with HD not long before the pandemic. Okay, so what was the world like for my brother and me when we first heard about Huntington's in 1994. Well, there were certainly no scenes like that in the Vatican or Buckingham Palace. There were no world leaders to shake the hands of HD patients. It wasn't even on the radar of pharmaceutical companies, let alone giving any hope or a hope, hope of treatments. There was no dignity, no part of humanity Families suffering from shame, stigma, ignorance, misdiagnosis, and misunderstanding. Then in 2006, in between tours of Iraq, I discovered that the disease that took my brother, inflicted, put up my father, inflicted on my brother the same terrible decline in, in his prime, will take me to. The neurologist who gave me the, that test result said, there's nothing you can do about this disease, just live your life as well as you can. Well, not a day went by when I didn't picture how my quality of life was going to drain away and fear that however much my friends might promise they'd always come and see me that they wouldn't really want to, just like I didn't really want to go and see my father when he lost the ability to converse with me. Two years after that test, I swapped war zones for the much tougher battlefield, 
countering the prejudice and the stigma surrounding HD. I decided I was going to take the disease on headlong with the conviction of the suicide bombers all around me. The way only someone with the certainty of their fate can do. I was going to mess HD up, although I actually used a different four-letter word. And that experience brought me into contact with every imaginable sphere of HD right across the world. And I learned a great deal. In fact, I learned so much that while that neurologist who gave me my test results said there was nothing I could do about the disease, the reality was there was everything I could do about the disease. The problem was going to be finding the time to do it all. So what have we changed? A lot. Let's start with the rights of HD families uh, across the border. Senator Ted Kennedy's last act of, of legislation, the Genetic Information Act, which I was proud to help word in a small way. And in other capitals than Rome, we found ways to exit the shadows. And this was the first ever political representation anywhere in the world for Huntington's disease, in England, in London. Uh, and as a result of that uh, 2010 all-party parliamentary group, I launched under that banner of Hidden No More, we proved with data something that had seemed to me anecdotally obvious, that the prevalence of HD was wildly underestimated. We found that it was more than twice that previously believed. And then came the revelation from research here in Canada, across in Vancouver and BC. Following on from that study, the show, research that showed that far from being a disease that most of the world needn't concern themselves with, one in 19 people could have a child with HD. In research, the engagement of those who have raised your heads, heads across above the parapet has enabled more engagement with science. And this is where we have all moved way ahead of the curve, driven by what are called not-for-profit initiatives. Now, I know that lots of you probably know what that means, but just in case, I, let me explain what they are. Uh, and why they matter, because I'm going to come back to this later. Um, unlike the for-profit companies, the, like pharma and biotechs, not-for-profits are charities like the HSC or foundations like the uh, American privately funded CHDI and universities. Now, these organizations, it's these organizations, not governments or health departments, that have made the difference. Because they have realized that we have to engage the pharmaceutical industry in drug development. Why? Well, because for HD, for people like Ray Truant, who you'll hear speak later, who many of you know, brilliant scientist, or Jeff Carroll, who will be speaking tomorrow, another brilliant, Jeff, another brilliant scientist, or for Ed Wild, these are academic researchers, okay? So they can have all the brilliant ideas in the world, and they do, but without pharma, they're never going to be translated into actual drugs that you and I can take. And pharma has to have biomarkers. Biomarkers are measurements of our disease's progression, which they need to convince regulators, they meaning the pharmaceutical companies need, to convince regulators that a drug works. Well, one you've probably all heard of is MRI scanners. That's me having one uh, as part of a, a seven-year observational study to create those bio, uh, various biomarkers called TRAC-HD. Um, and that 
kind of forward thinking has created a, a snowball effect unique to our, our disease because we know who is going to develop HD in the future. Each discovery brings another series of avenues of exploration. Now that blood, that actual blood coming out of my arm into that vial and all those vials there, exact, that exact blood was used, that was taken 15 years ago, was used much later in the establishment of a biomarker that no one had ever heard of. Uh, I was complaining that, in, uh, that day about saying, so why on earth could you need, I don't really like giving blood much, and I said, why, why do you need so much? Surely, you know, what could you use all this blood for? Seriously. So, this is a good story, because that blood then became the, amongst with others, of course, that which ascertained a new biomarker called NFL. Not the National Football League, <laughs> but neurofilament light change. And one of those uh, dots there is me. So yeah, so this new biomarker, which had no one had ever heard of when I was giving that blood. You see what happens? The cause and effect of the interaction between us and these researchers. Now, if you want to know more about uh, NFL, there's a really uh, a much better way of finding out it than me, uh, and that's to watch my postcard from Dubrovnik, which was the CHDI conference. To those who don't know, I do a postcard every year. It's usually from Palm Springs, from the CHDI conference. Uh, and, and this one, um, uh, this year, has uh, uh, a, 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 an interview with a guy called Henrik Zetterberg, and he is the world leading expert on this subject. He looks pretty cool as well because he's got like, got like a ZZ top beard. Um, <laughs> he's quite, oh, he's really entertaining. So, and he explains uh, in this uh, how this biomarker, which simply just comes from our blood, is transforming research into HD. It is really cool, and it's. Um, you can see it on, uh, you can see that postcard either on the CHDI website or on my foundation website, which is hiddennomore.com. So that's NFL, just another part of this story. Then we have Enroll HD. Now, this is just an amazing story. In just over a decade, participation in, in this has grown from one person in one country to more than 20 countries across four continents. Here in Canada, still in sites in Montreal, North York, Ottawa, Alberta, British Columbia, and Calgary, 1,651 participants in Canada have enrolled in this HD, and I suspect that uh, there are some in this room but it's anonymous, so I won't ask you to stand up, but well done to those people. All right. uh, and this, this is creating a database of clinical trial participation. It's da data that's unmatched in any equivalent disease. And, and you know what amazing thing? <coughs> It's all freely available to researchers and pharma companies looking to develop drugs for HD. I, I've just been on a, a three-week sp speaking tour of um, American biotechs, and you know ones which are thinking of coming into HD. And you know what the most the most powerful incentive I have to offer those companies is the DNA database of Enroll HD subjects. No other study in medicine has surpassed the success of, 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 a, of, of um, Enroll. It is uh, the ultimate win-win. Infrastructure of the HD clinics have been strengthened. Outstanding talent has entered the field. 
and the visibility of HD has grown because of it, we, now so, we know so much more about how HD progresses because of enroll. And people in the trials, most of all, people in the trials have actually benefited simply by taking part because they are in, know that they're engaged in a mission and not alone. And I, I'm going to tell you this is something I absolutely believe myself, okay? And please pass this on to anyone you know who is not engaged in HD and perhaps in Enroll, that I firmly believe that engaging in something like, H, like, like Enroll HD actually slows the progression of your disease or delays the onset. The kind of thing that a drug would try and do. I absolutely believe it. You can't have a, cl a clinician like Jeff can't say that, because, or Ed can't say that because they need the data, but I, I can, because I can say what I want. <laughs> right? So, join in roll and it'll help you. That's what I'm saying. Um, So that's enroll. What else? The exponential rise in understanding of our disease has actually created yet more biomarkers than NFL. This is one uh, cerebral spinal fluid, which I'm holding there. Looks, looks a bit like gin. Um, but it's not because if it was, Ed would have drunk it then by then. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's just another of the tools that, that we've developed from, from patient uh, contribution. And as we've moved, moved the goalposts of research, so we have moved them too for communication. We now have unparalleled access to information about research and care for those with HD, with websites like the award-winning HD Buzz. Uh, and you will be hearing much more from those brilliant communicators tomorrow, I think. Yes. Um, and then, of course, just as important, we have a site for young people uh, affected by HD, HDEO. Um, how many people do you think would have been actively involved in Huntington's disease 20 years ago? Not one. So this is amazing what is going on here. And all of this interaction collates expertise. That is that established standard of care, uh, so missing when my father was alive, that's that fed by data from studies like Enroll HD, it has grown and grown. So where else is HD cool? Uh, well, because of its unique genetic nature, HD is a vanguard for the future for everyone. Not just ethical issues, that's another lecture, but the nature of medicine, where doctors will look at the tre treatment of symptoms as a last resort, treating disease before it get, makes us ill. We're ahead of that curve too, with regulatory organizations like the FDA which we are in contact with, readdressing what is an acceptable point to intervene in HD. And I think that Ray, the Professor Truant will probably be speaking more about this, but we'll, we'll, there's another, just another place where we are ahead of everyone else. And this is a um, shift which, of course, will demand more sophisticated biomarkers, and you know what? That's what we're creating. And it will also need a recognition of the unique genetic nature of our disease. During all of this time, our patient groups have developed from a shoulder to cry on to important tools for families to engage in research, to national organizations like this one, and on to a global movement of families, support groups, and researchers. This global movement is melting bit by bit 
the fear of our disease by the power of information and integration, those forces of trust and collaboration empower communication. Communication leads to understanding. Understanding dilutes fear, and the vacuum left by fear can be filled with hope. And that hope springs most obviously from the promise of treatments. Since I was last here, we have reached a critical point because of the uh, global collaboration that I have been describing here, where the future graph for us gene carriers, HD gene carriers, is no longer unremittingly downward. For the first time in the history of our, of our disease, there are unknown variables ahead. The difference between nothing and the possibility of something, the difference between variations in the rate of decline and the chance that there might just be a year when the graph goes up. We've reached We've reached that point because we've allowed researchers to make mistakes. In fact, to allow them to know that they have to make mistakes, to use those mistakes to climb upward like, a, like broken bricks piled against a wall. Which brings me to Roche and its clinical trial of an ASO developed by Ionis Pharmaceuticals. There was enormous excitement across the entire HD community in 2017 that at last a real disease modifying treatment could be on the horizon. Now this is me trying and failing miserably to look brave as <laughs> Professor Ed Wild inserts a needle into my spine. Look away if you don't like things like this. I was one of those who volunteered to see if the consistently good Ionis animal data could be replicated in humans. My dose was 120 megs every 16 weeks. There was another one, another cohort for the same volume every eight weeks. And before each dose, the cerebral spinal fluid that you saw in that other picture earlier was extracted to give a remarkably precise measure of the level of the mutant hunting, Huntington protein. The technology that was going to be used in the trial was unprecedented. Wearable and portable devices transmitting in, in real time huge quantities of data, gigabytes of it, measuring the effect of the drug on disease progression. All the signs pointing to the, to the certainty of success. And in, a, and in February 2018, Professor Sarah Tabrizi showed the CHGI conference a graph which I actually saw bring tears to the eyes of researchers. The Huntington protein was lowered in participants given the Roche Ionis drug. And even more importantly, the higher the dose, the greater the reduction of the mutant protein. So now, surely, the next step, re replicating the effect on disease progression we've seen in animal models, would just be a formality. Then, in the depths of COVID lockdown, a bolt from the blue, astonishing researchers and us families. The trial of the drug, by then called Tominersen, was stopped because in some participants, symptoms had got worse. The result among our community was a communal grief, as much as you could have anything communal during COVID. It wasn't an anger, it was just a stunned, silent incomprehension and for the research community, now the whole strategy of Huntington lowering that had been the bedrock of so many companies' research 
was thrown into question. And then another twist. Another twist. At last year's CHDI conference, Roche announced that in fact some participants, those on 16 week dosing, did in fact show some improvement. They told me in an interview in that year's postcard, which you can still see in part from Palm Springs, that the dosing had been too high. Although to coin a phrase, not statistically significant, it was enough to warrant a new trial. Now these trials don't cost tens of millions, it's hundreds of millions. And if, if Roche is spending that money, you know it, they don't think it's a drug that doesn't work. So Tom and Nielsen, and more importantly, Huntington Lowering, uh, are back in the game. And whilst you will not hear this from the Roche guys because they are ethically and legally bound not, to not promise too much, I'm going to say it here because I can say what I want. <laughs> this was proof of principle that the harmful protein which causes our disease can be lowered. The Roche setback was a road bump, not a brick wall. Now, now, I don't want to tread on the presentations of the HD Buzz guys uh, uh, tomorrow about how much is going on in this field, um, so I'll sort of leave that to them. Uh, watch this space. But I do sense, personally, that 2024 is going to be bring a real change in momentum, a real new momentum in therapies for us. And I want to kickstart this new chapter with a talk that I just recorded for the TED platform. Uh, it's going online in the, net, within, in the next couple of weeks. Um, it talks about where, where, how we have reached a pivotal moment in the history of our disease because of uh, our global collaboration. Um, it's called the untapped capability of every human being, and that's a very deliberate title. First, because I describe in the talk that it's the, how it's the extraordinary strength and courage of you guys, the patient community, that has allowed us to survive such headwinds whilst caring for loved ones surrounded by shame. When, in fact, some, before they get sick of these human beings, have capabilities more than higher than the average person, they have been shrouded by stigma and hidden. Not just surviving, but now empowering researchers with unprecedented sets of data with our DNA. But also because of the researchers and clinicians who have never given up on us. When you see this talk, I think that you will realize that there's never been a talk about HD like it. So what I want every one of you to do is first of all, watch it, then make sure that everyone back in your HD communities see it, and then I want the members of your families who are still not engaging, like you are, I know you are because you're here, I want them who are not engaging because they're still scared, we all know them, to see it. And then I want you to find at least one person who's never heard of HD to watch it. Because we have to get this message beyond the HD choir. And there's no better pl platform than TED to do that. So, also, I am launching a competition here not open to anyone who was at that talk, and there were people who were there who are here, uh, so no cheating, right? 
So there's a prize to anyone who can say what it was I was holding in my right hand at that point during my TED talk. I can, uh, uh, entries are going to be uh, written down with your name and there is going to be a basket with a re registration, right, with Charles Quiz written on it. So you can write your name and you'll get, what am I holding in my hand? Um, uh, uh, and you can have that entry uh, during the conference. Now, I can warn you that this is not easy. I did this same competition with the scientists at the HSG meeting in Phoenix a couple of weeks ago, and no one got it, not one of those brilliant scientists. Jim Gasella and Marcy McDonald, right, who discovered the location of the Huntington gene in, in 1993, they had three tries each and still didn't get it. Right, okay. And of course, you will all discover the answer anyway in a couple of which weeks when you, the talk goes online. Okay. So, 25 years of watching men kill each other has taught me another truth about them, and that is that human beings lose their moral compass, their social equilibrium, if you like, when you take two things away from them, dignity and hope. In spite of that vacuum, our community has survived because the very best of humanity surrounds it. So I'm going to end with a bit of videotape, which some of you will have definitely seen before. It's even in the TED Talk. But I'm not going to apologize for showing it again because I think it's a, a message worth repeating that the human spirit uh, is capable of anything. In 1991, after the Gulf War that did not remove Saddam, I went to the Iranian border with Iraq after rumors that Kurdish refugees were spilling across it. And what we found, unknown to anyone else in the Western world, was a sea of humanity pouring over those mountains, a million people mostly women and children, running from Saddam's chemical attacks in the north of Iraq, in the, in the town, amongst others, of Erbil. It was winter, bitterly cold. And the image imprinted in my mind till the day I die was one particular girl of about 12. She was clambering over the rocks, focused on survival. On her back, her younger sister, two or three years old, unconscious, barely alive. She had carried that child almost 90 miles. All humans are capable of far more than you can ever believe. And it's organizations like the HSC and all of you families who have brought about this new chapter in our disease, taking responsibility for making things happen. If we left all of this to health authorities, we wouldn't just be 50 years behind. We would never have left the starting box of understanding HD. And we certainly wouldn't all be in this room. We would have got as far as this little girl from Erbil if her sister had not taken responsibility herself for getting her out of Iraq. When I started this new role I have in 2006, there was not one single industry company, pharma or biotech, invested in finding a treatments for our disease. At this year's CHD, CHGI co a conference in Dubrovnik, there were 47 companies from industry. And that growth is just in the last 17 years. Imagine where the next 17 are heading. Thank you, and have a brilliant conference.
Hello, Shelley. No, yes, Charles. Forget the no, sirs. Thank you. You're welcome. That, that's yours, right? That one's mine, yes. Thank you so much, Charles, for your wonderful presentation. So in this, our 50th anniversary, we decided it was time for a refresh of our logo for a variety of reasons. In light of this, we're going to take a trip down memory lane with Jimmy Pollard, who has pulled together a presentation detailing the story of our logo over the past five decades, when it began, how it has changed, and who else has adopted it over the years. So Jimmy. So uh, once upon a time, these two people needed a logo. And they came up with this. It went viral before going viral was a thing. <laughs> it went south. That's Mexico. It went to Costa Rica. It then went to Venezuela. It went to Colombia. It went to Peru. It went to Chile. It went to Argentina. It went to Brazil. It covers the world. There's the International Huntington Association logo. It goes across Europe, European Huntington Association. But it also went east to Europe Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales, uh, Portugal, Northern Ireland, uh, Spain, all over Spain, man, Catalan, Salamanca, uh, Burgos, the, to, out to the Canary Islands, Madrid, it went north to Finland. It went to Germany. It went to the Czech Republic. Back to Spain, Valencia. Um, I can't even read that, excuse me. Bulgaria, correct? No. Okay. And back to Spain, Galicia, France, Austria, Belgium, Greece. Uh, can't read that one. I'm sorry. But anyway, adopted also by Dimitri Pofe, the gentleman who rode his bike from uh, Mexico City all the way down to Patagonia um, and his Explore for Huntington project. More recently, Bulgaria, then it went through the Mediterranean, through uh, Mallorca, through Malta, onto Cyprus. Then it kept moving in that direction all the way to New Zealand. There's the Auckland one over to Australia, Queensland, New South Wales, and it's not a ripple anymore. It is under people's skin. So there are many, many logo tattoos that I know people here in this room have today. Um, so, well done. And now, back to Shelley. And here we go with our new logo. At the beginning of the month, we unveiled our enhanced logo. The colors are now blue and purple to represent Huntington disease and juvenile Huntington disease. These colors are fresh and vibrant and provide high contrast, which is a really important accessibility consideration. There are a few other changes. 
We standardized the font to be sans serif to improve readability. We've kept the emblem on the head and torso of a person, originally designed because HD has both mental and physical effects, wrapped in a vibrant, growing flower. This symbolizes our community and the care and support it gives and receives. Newly incorporated is the importance of research in our collective mission in the form of a DNA helix represented in the eye in Huntington disease. Our refreshed logo now reflects both HD and JHD, as well as the two pillars of our society and community, which is research and care. In a neat connection, Taylor Crane, our graphic design volunteer and son of community member Dean Crane, worked on this project. <clears throat> our new logo honors HSC's past while representing all aspects of our community and the work that we do. So before we leave, I want to mention two opportunities for involvement at conference. You may have heard of our 50 for 50 campaign. That's our goal to sign up 50 new monthly donors in honor of our 50th anniversary. Monthly donors are key to us being able to gain or to plan for and provide consistent services. We need your help and any monthly amount makes a huge difference. We have a large bell at the HSC booth at, in the resource fair where you, when you sign up as a monthly donor at conference, you get to ring that bell. We'll be counting down to our goal of 50 and we really hope to reach our target while we're here at conference. This is also a time when memories of loved ones who have faced HD uh, are particularly strong. At the back of the great rooms, right here where we hold our keynote, we have our Garden of Memories Dragonfly Arch to remember those who have passed. Ring the chime in remembrance of a loved one who faced Huntington disease. Throughout the conference, we will pay homage to them all with each sound of remembrance. Now we have a break until 11.15 when we'll have our first breakout sessions. If you need help finding your room, ask a conference volunteer. They have the bright and colorful name badges with the purple lanyards. Uh, I look forward to chatting with you all during the next uh, two days. Enjoy, and please attendees, make sure you fill out your evaluation forms after every session and bring them to the room monitor or the registration desk. Thank you all.